Okay, thanks very much for being here tonight. It's an honor for both of us to be here. We're very excited to uh, tell you about the book we've written and, and a projection of where we can go in the future and uh, a little bit about the past. Um, we'll have some questions and answers from the audience, and we've got a couple special surprises video-wise that we're going to try to run through you and see how, it, how, they, uh, how they work tonight. I guess the first thing, you know, when in writing this book, it's, it's with Buzz being the person he is, I mean, how many people were here on the planet that watched <laughs> Apollo 11 land? Okay, and how many have actually walked on the moon? Anybody here? <laughs> but I, you know, it's, it, it's, even though we've written the book to talk about the future, um, you always are remiss about trying to get him back at about a thousand feet above the moon. Neil, you, what's that like? I, I just remembered as a kid a lot of alarms going off. I, wouldn't, I didn't know if you were going to make it or what was going to happen. But take us back to that day and get us about 1,000 feet above the moon. And well, you were calm, right? <laughs> well, um, the, the problem started to arise at about 30,000 feet when uh, we we're going with engine first, of course, to slow down, looking down this way, and we yawed around and pitched forward so that the landing radar could begin to pick up uh, uh, range and velocity from the surface and then uh, update the computer, uh, improve on the accuracy of the computer. Uh, and there was, a, of course, a, a difference between what the computer said and what the radar said, and that began to grow smaller and smaller, indicating that the uh, good information from the radar was uh, altering the knowledge of the computer. And that's good, that's good. Uh, but what was not so good was the program alarms that started coming on about once every two minutes and uh, distracted us uh, considerably all, all the way down to about, uh, oh, maybe, maybe 3,000 feet. They changed from a 1202 alarm to a 1201 alarm. Now, how many people out here know what the hell that means? <laughs> we didn't either. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was buried away in a thing called the GNN Dictionary, the Guidance and Navigation dictionary that, that had all sorts of good information about uh, the computer, including uh, what the program alarms meant. Uh, and fortunately, there was a guy back in Houston who uh, kind of understood that, looked into it, and uh, felt that as long as it uh, didn't reoccur, uh, more frequently than maybe once a minute, we were okay. So he gave the uh, he, he gave the uh, signal uh, to the flight director, who gave the okay to the capsule communicator, which is always an astronaut. Uh, in this case, it was uh, Charlie Duke, uh, who said, "Well, we'll go uh, on that alarm," and uh, even when it changed, so. Passing through a thousand feet, uh, we'd been distracted a little bit, and Neil felt that we were coming toward an area that was not the most desirable. <clears throat> he described it as a boulder field with lots of big rocks. Uh, it was a it was a crater, and uh, uh, it was not a good place to land. And the prudent thing to do without a lot of hand signals is not veer to the left, <laughs> veer to the right, or pitch up to slow down and land short. It's to fly over to the other side. Wonderful. Except the fuel gauge goes down <laughs> when you do that. 
you're running out of fuel. You, ha you only have seconds yeah, of fuel. Yeah, and uh, uh, well, a little bit before that, from a thousand feet, uh, we got the call, and a light came on uh, in on the instrument panel, uh, low level. That means you got 60 seconds of fuel left, and Charlie Duke. Uh, back in Houston, called out 60 seconds. <laughs> We're still 100 feet above. I began to get a little worried. Uh, could could this good friend of mine on the left uh, ease this thing down without getting too nervous? And I didn't want to <laughs> uh, increase his uh, anxiety. Uh, I was using my own little body English to. Uh, <laughs> Well, we got down and, and we heard the call 30 seconds. This time we were 10 feet above the ground. Ah, that's okay, we got it made. The engine quits, we'll bounce, hard landing, but both of us are pilots and we've had hard landings before. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but then I could see out in front, the sun is behind us. Matter of fact, it's, it's lower than the angle, which gives, uh, uh, shadows of, of the crater, so it gives the definition of what what we're going toward. But it also casts our shadow out in front of us, and I could see that getting closer and closer. And uh, then it began to look a little hazy because that's the all the dust uh, kicking out. So I notified Neil of these observations. Now, of course, I'm reading out altitude. <laughs> altitude rate and velocity over the ground. The, this computer is very smart. It gives us three pieces of information. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> Not in color. Uh, <laughs> and their altitude, altitude rate and velocity over the ground. So I'm reading this out so that Neil can keep looking out the window and uh, get the thing uh, down on the ground, and uh, as soon as it uh, is just about on the ground, uh, a little rod that it protrudes from each landing gear plan, uh, uh, flat area, uh, it bends, because it just touched the surface. And when it bends, it uh, sends a signal up, and the light comes on, and uh, I call out the name of that light, which is contact light, and that means engine stop, so we shut off the engine, and uh, uh, we're here to stay, for a while anyway. So your, your voice was, I guess in a sense, the first voice from the moon in the sense of a contact light? Was that accurate? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay. A few other uh, necessary words. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> No, they were clean words. They were not. Uh... <laughs> well, let's let's do a little bit of something else about being on. That's the enough for the moon. Let's get on to Mars. Yeah. Well, let's don't leave too soon. But there is something that that we talked about in the book that I think we try to highlight. And I'm just trying to get this thing to move a little bit, but I don't know what's happening on that. Um, you had a great term when you were out there. I mean, we, it's a magnificent desolation. I, I, to yeah. me, it was two words that don't necessarily come together in your mind, but yet when you stood out there, it was this desolate but yet magnificent. It was spontaneous to me. Uh, Neil had described uh, something about it looking like the high plains of the U.S., uh, and, and then something he, he said, he said, I heard the word beautiful. And that struck a note. And I didn't think it was particularly beautiful. But I responded with uh, contrasting words, and, uh, which I sometimes use just to emphasize uh, the meaning of both of them. And that was magnificent desolation. Think of the human species growing up, looking at that thing up there, and man, finally, two human beings 
uh, uh, are going to land and walk around. That's magnificent testimony to the uh, perseverance of the human race, accepting challenges. But looking at what I saw, just shades of gray, sunlit behind, but then you can see the horizon because there's no atmosphere and it, it is just so sharp uh, because of no atmosphere. And it's uh, sunlit lunar surface against the black sky. It's velvet black. It has sort of a sheen to it. Um, and, and if you tilt way back, you can see that uh, thing that has been called a little blue dot. That's you guys. That's Earth. That's where you all were, or were going to be. Uh, and it uh, looks a little lonesome, because everybody else except three of us are back there. What's, what's that like, and how many people were watching television at the time? Millions, it was one of the largest, or the largest at the time, uh, televised. Six million? Six million. Oh, wait a minute. That's, that's the entire Earth. There weren't that many. But it was a lot. It was a lot a of lot. people. And did you feel, I mean, you mentioned it just briefly there. I mean, is it, is it how lonely is lonely? I mean, what, do you, you've got mission control and everybody <laughs> yakking in your ear. Do you feel lonely when you're in that kind of environment with a big space suit on and the oxygen flow? And well, all we probably were the most trained for any specific task to be done by human beings. We trained mostly on uh, fixing things that went wrong, sometimes called emergency procedures. Um, spent a lot, awful lot of time on that <clears throat> and uh, frankly, as long as things are going okay, uh, you feel like uh, this, this is pretty good. I hope this lasts this way. Uh, we're fat, dumb, and happy. Is that it? No, that's not it. But, <laughs> well, but you know, in, in putting the book together, I mean, clearly the moon, first of all, it's visible. I went out and looked at Mars the other night, and it's pretty far away. I mean, it's definitely not the moon. It's a long way out there. Yeah. yeah. Now, you guys are, here's, here's you and Neil on the moon, and maybe run the next one. Um, you, have, you have to run that one forward for even me to tell who's who. Yeah. Because uh, at, the, at the end of this little uh, one frame a second, uh, somebody stands off to the side and uh, salutes the flag, and that's me. Now, when, you, when we talk about the moon today, when we look at the moon, uh, as we write in the book, it's, it's a different, we, I think we have uh, chapters, you know, I, you see a different kind of moon today. How would you characterize what you, in summary, feel about how the moon plays a role in the future of space exploration? It certainly uh, clearly was the obvious place to visit first. Once we can break the bonds of orbiting around the Earth uh, at various altitudes, we're, we're sort of constrained by the radiation belts, not, not to put humans uh, much above three, four hundred uh, miles. Uh, otherwise, you get in the radiation belts. Um, but, but once uh, humans get Beyond that point, the logical place to go is to go to the moon. Uh, and of course, uh, it had been visited many times by robots. One of them had a camera and took pictures of the backside of the moon and named them after countrymen uh, and that's why all the craters are Russian, named after Russian uh, people. They beat us to a number of things in the space program. Uh, but we persevered. We had a plan in mind. 
we had a deadline, objective, deadline, and a plan. This is the space race. This is what you were, this is what we, in the 50s, what we really embraced. We were in some competitive race. Yeah, it, it, it's good to call it a competition, which it was, but it was a seeking of national prestige. We wanted that, they wanted that. And we felt that uh, setting that objective within a decade is something that the president felt we could do. And uh, that is what he did. He set, uh, within the decade, send a man to the moon and bring him back safely. A man, not two, uh, not walking around, just to the moon uh, and come back safely. So we could have landed, looked out the window, taken a few pictures and come back and satisfied. But no, we wanted to do more once having done that. Uh, actually, we followed a very bold, bold mission. The second time we flew the uh, Apollo spaceship. And the first time we ever put a crew on top of the big Saturn V rocket, we sent them to the moon. What a bold uh, gesture. What a bold move that was. Um, we were afraid the Russians might do what they'd done twice, unmanned, that they might send a cosmonaut around the moon and back and say, hey, we're first. We, we got to the moon first. So that's why we accelerated uh, Apollo 8. Just so happened that uh, uh, Neil Armstrong and I were on the backup crew uh, of Apollo 8. And since uh, when they flew, there was already a crew assigned Apollo 9 and to Apollo 10. So we rotated to Apollo 11. Uh, changing from backup to the prime crew, and uh, essentially the prime crew on Apollo 8 would be our backup. That, that's how a lot of the uh, crew assignments uh, went. Um, and again, you were I lucky. was in the right place at the right time. Well, talk about a little bit about, uh, maybe move up the slide here, the next slide, and, and see, let me see where we're going now. I mean, we, we talk about robots today. There's curiosity. It's a $1 billion rover. It's running around. It's it just uh, past uh, birthday. It's yes, been there for right, a year. Right. I was there. You were there, too, yeah, in yeah, uh, right, the Jet yeah. Propulsion Lab. And they landed that. And, and uh, But one of the things we try to cover in the book uh, pretty extensively is that training ground of the moon today to run robots could give us a handle on exploration of Mars, not putting people on Mars right off the bat, but uh, running robots uh, on Mars from your suggestion is uh, one of the moons of Mars, Phobos and Deimos, yes. there's two uh, moons. I, you I, like moons, I guess, is the moon, big thing. The moon. moon. Two you moons. like moons. Two moons. Phobos and Deimos is two moons around Mars. One of them goes around in seven hours, the other one in 30 hours. Uh, so there, our moon goes around in 27 and a half days. So these moons are much, much closer to, uh, to Mars. And uh, uh, a, uh, a story I like to tell, it's not a story, it's really a fact, an observation from somebody who knows what he's talking about. This is the program manager of uh, a mission that went to Mars and landed two rovers on opposite sides of Mars, Spirit and Opportunity. They were supposed to last 90 days. At the end of five years, uh, Spirit got stuck. Opportunity is still working. Now, the program manager of all of this right from the beginning, uh, Steve Squires from Cornell, uh, made the observation in writing that what those two 
Rovers did in those five years on opposite sides and could have been done in one week if we had human intelligence in orbit around Mars directing those two rovers almost instantaneously communicate and see what the what the direction what, what the uh, direction that the rover is doing you see that directly you can't do that from earth the uh, the closest earth ever gets to mars is four minutes at the speed of light which is the speed of a radio transmission so to send send a command to something uh, it takes four minutes to get there, and what it does takes four minutes for you to see what it did. So that's eight, eight minutes. And you can't control anything uh, with, with any uh, degree of uh, uh, satisfaction. So you send a whole day's worth of instructions, and that's why uh, it takes so long to accomplish things, because they're, they're not... Um, uh, They're, they're very cautious one day's set of instructions. And it sort of says that if the rover gets into not too good a position, stop, stop. We'll figure it out and, uh, and fix it in a couple of days. And that's why uh, one of the keys to uh, US involvement at the moon is to take two early interplanetary Mars spacecraft and put them uh, at a distance on the far side and the near side of the moon, which is closer, much closer than transmissions from the Earth. So that, that those two uh, control centers can operate robots uh, on the surface, and we've learned how to do a very good job of doing that uh, at, at Mars, and uh, we can do that almost in what space people call real time. That means you do something and you watch it happen. Uh, I guess that's what real so time it, means. You're really talking about staging grounds here of just testing and yeah, improving. Yeah, I'm, I'm talking about initial activities at the moon is sending early versions of the interplanetary spacecraft. We're testing them out at the moon, doing interesting things, certainly. Uh, on the near side, that'll eventually become a fuel depot, and on the far side, it can control robotically an antenna on the far side that doesn't have any Earth noise but looks outward away from Earth and the Moon to get m much more so radio accurate yeah, radio telescope. Yeah. But the most important thing is to construct the International Lunar Base. These are big objects, habitats, big things. Uh, now, in, in zero gravity, in free space, it's pretty easy to bring these things slowly together and uh, dock, make contact. But on an uneven surface, it's not so easy at all. You, you put the first one down, and you don't want to land the second one right on top, so you have a safe distance away. Now you've got to robotically send a, a flatbed and a crane over there to pick it up, bring it over, and then hook it together so people can go from one to the other, and electricity and uh, fluids. It's tough stuff. How do we learn how to do that? On the big island of Hawaii, we put the prototypes there, and we practice doing that through a, a satellite back to uh, Houston Control. And uh, so we do, on Earth, what we're then going to demonstrate for the, the other countries. But we, the United States, is going to learn how to
to build a base, bring it together, so that we know how to do that from the moon of Mars on the surface of Mars. So that's essentially the master plan. And once we built a permanent base on the surface of Mars, it is now time to go and occupy that permanently. So you we, talk about human settlements. I mean, we're talking now mm -hmm. a time frame where we're actually uh, sending people on a regular uh, basis and uh, the astronauts that sign up for tour of duty are going to have to be committed to perhaps live on another world on a very long period of time. It's a little bit different yep. than Antarctica or some <laughs> of these bases. I mean, you're pretty far away from home. Uh, so learning how to logistically live there and, and uh, work in the environment and also live off the land. How do you use the resources of Mars? Uh, this Na is all NASA has a word for that, or a couple of words. <laughs> I-S-R-U. In situ. Well, is this a test? In situ resource utilization. Of course, I always have to go and look at what in situ means. It sounds like some doctor practice. No, what, what they say. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's not right. Well, it, uh, so, but the point here, when you start thinking about the future, let's back away. Yes, it is. Uh, interplanetary. Uh... Okay. I'm not going to argue with it. He always had the upper hand when we were writing the book, believe me. Space resource <laughs> utilization. I was close. <laughs> okay. But when you start putting the master plan, you mentioned master plan, and, and you've had some pretty, let's, let's run up a bunch of slides here, because I want to get to the politics of space. There's a potential lunar base, but let's go to the next one. Let's keep, there we go. Now you're, uh, <laughs> now you're in somebody's ear there. Uh, trying to, uh, he always says himself he's got interesting ears, so did he get a bit of a listen? Well, I, I talked my way onto Air Force One. How many people here have been on Air Force One, by the way? That's another thing. <laughs> uh, you talked your way in. I, I, I talked, yeah. My mission director, uh, Christina, yep. said, that'll never happen. <laughs> and I give her a phone call from uh, Air Force One. <laughs> Now, I thought I might have an opportunity to have a little tete-a-tete -tete with the president about yeah. space. Nah. The, the, the time that I was needed was when we landed, taxi, opened the door, then I was needed uh, to stand next to the president and wave to the crowd <laughs> and, and get on the stairs and go down the stairs together. And here we are, walking to the crowd. Okay. So, he seems happy. You seem to at least have some moments there uh, talking to him. Maybe <laughs> the next slide. Let me see what the next one is. I'm sure you've told him about the master plan and what you were trying to get to, but how disappointed are you? You've met presidents over the course of your life and after the Apollo landing. The politics of space. Are we in a situation when, because you know, I'm sure you get this all the time, people, well, why are we spending the money on space? I mean, we've we got so many issues down here, yeah. and, it, it, you know, you can't cavalierly throw that away. I mean, no. people are always worried about cost and, and, and money. So how do, uh, how do you bracket presidential leadership at this point about space exploration and American well, leadership? Uh, way back. In the 60s, the Russians were putting up Sputnik, Yuri Gagarin. Um, short time later, the president said, we're going to go to the moon uh, within this decade. But we hadn't even put anyone in orbit yet. Uh, it, was, uh, it was a bold challenge. And the Russians continued to get a little bit ahead of us until the two-man Gemini spacecraft between Mercury and Apollo, uh, we began to do some really uh, pioneering things. And it certainly looked as though uh, we were moving right along. And uh, then we started, uh, well, right after the last two-man, which was my first space flight with Jim Lovell, 
Is Shortly that after that, um, we had a setback, the Apollo fire in January of uh, 1967. And uh, Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee were killed in the, in the launch pad fire. Now, Ed White was a very close friend of mine. He was a year behind me uh, at West Point and had uh, gotten me into a really a great squadron um, uh, over in Germany. All of that is in s several of the books that I've uh, written. Um, that set us back because uh, uh, it took us over a year to recover and uh, make sure that we uh, didn't have a chance of a fire breaking out in the spacecraft uh, again. We removed all the flammable. We uh, stopped using 100% uh, oxygen uh, in the spacecraft uh, un un until we were uh, way, way up in, uh, uh, in orbit or in space. Um, but after that, we uh, started flying the command module, the spacecraft, in Earth orbit once. Then the second time, as I said before, we took that spacecraft and that crew uh, on the big rocket and went to the moon to orbit for uh, uh, 10 revolutions uh, of two hours each, uh, Christmas time. 1968. We got into trouble with uh, <laughs> uh, somebody who didn't like the uh, mixing of government and religion uh, because the crew read from Genesis in the Bible. Very moving uh, experience uh, Christmas Eve to hear the words of uh, uh, Genesis. It was a great, great, successful mission. Probably saved us uh, six months uh, of but time. But the, the politics of the time are different than today because you had to you had to take a hit, and people had the Kennedy dream of getting mm -hmm. to the moon and getting you there. The but the politics of today, when you think about uh, whether it's Obama, I mean, we've gone through a, yeah. a lot of different space policies. What does it say about America today as far as leadership in space? We've got China that just launched a crew, brought them yep. back from their own little space station. Uh, they're going to be launching a robot to the moon at year's end. Uh, I've just written some new things yeah. on China, and it's very interesting. They're, they almost have the passion that we had in the 60s. Is that fair? Well, they uh, observed all the things that uh, we did and the Russians did and learned from our achievements and uh, got a lot of uh, information from the Russians about how to build a spacecraft. Their uh, human spacecraft, uh, Shenzhou, uh, looks very much like the uh, Soyuz, probably has improvements uh, on it. But they've now built a small space station in Earth orbit and have had a crew up there. And they certainly intend to uh, take the prestige prize of uh, getting to the moon with, uh, they, they don't call their uh, space people astronauts, they call them tachonauts. What does that mean? You don't know? Okay. Space units. We have space units. We have tychonauts. We have astronauts. Cosmonauts. Cosmonauts. Yeah, but they want their own name. Tychonaut <laughs> sounds good. Uh, any of they, anyway, they are proving to be formidable, uh, advancing civilization that certainly feels that they will lead the world by 2050 or beyond. Um, that's not in my game plan, particularly. Uh, but are, are we talking leadership in the sense of uh, American leadership being a dominant force in space when we got all these other countries doing things? I mean, what is your thoughts? Uh, what are your thoughts about cooperation? I mean, we 
You know, we were actually, even in the middle of the space race, Kennedy yeah. was actually very interested in perhaps going with Russia to the moon yeah. and joining forces. What, how about today? Do we, how do we be, keep leadership and, and still maintain maybe a cooperative role with that? Well, it, it, it is true uh, that uh, before he was assassinated, uh, one month after I was picked as an astronaut, uh, he, he did feel that uh, maybe uh, joining together with the Russians to go to the moon might be a good thing. Uh, President Johnson, I don't think, agreed with that. Uh, so that didn't happen. Uh, but what did happen uh, is the Outer Space Treaty of 1967, which uh, was motivated by the concern in the United States that Russia might get to the moon first and uh, claim that they own the moon. So the Outer Space Treaty uh, d doesn't allow any nation to uh, own anything uh, in, in space. Um, and of course, we did get to the moon first, put our flag on it, not the UN flag, not flags of all the nations, but our flag. That's symbolic of uh, national achievement and will always be that, uh, that way. Uh, and there are six flags on the surface of the moon. Ours is, or was, the best looking flag, <laughs> without a doubt. <laughs> However, because it was pretty close to the spacecraft, when we lifted off, we blew it over. <laughs> Don't tell anybody. No, no, Neil did not want the public to know that uh, he saw the flag <laughs> all over. Well, let's, let's it's, it's still up there. Yeah. <laughs> but let's, uh, maybe in the last few things, because I, I don't know, I, I'm yeah. looking for time and how we're doing, and I want to make sure we have questions and answers. and. Uh, Cooperation. What's the, yeah. yeah. Well, also, the, the, there's a window of opportunity here for a president. Uh, when we talk in the book a lot about settlement of Mars and how we get there, and the book is really, the, the, the title is, says something, Mission to Mars, but, but are all the stepping stones that you've laid out is what we describe. But well, is there a window of opportunity for the President of the United States to, to make a declarative statement about human settlement on Mars. You feel there is. We got something well, coming. You, you can imagine out there that I've given this a lot of thought. Um, and uh, uh, it, it was announced from the podium that uh, I thought we would uh, get to Mars by 2030. Uh, no, no, uh, that was uh, a projection uh, when I first submitted my plan uh, in uh, 2009, uh, we had a commission that uh, President Obama uh, selected uh, that was looking uh, toward the future. Um, but uh, my plan now, revised, uh, is, is generous and I hope affordable, but it is quite safe. We demonstrate unmanned uh, return from the moon of Mars before people go there and then have to return. We demonstrate several landings on the surface of Mars from orbit and from the uh, continuously uh, cycling system that is the transportation system of humans from Earth uh, to Mars. Uh, and, and I think it's going to take uh, about 2040 before we can do that. Uh, if we do the right things and don't do the wrong things, we can spend an awful lot of money on big rockets and big landers and go and land on the moon and be welcomed by the Chinese. That's not a good plan. <laughs> Besides that, I just don't think the American people would get enthusiastic about that at all. Uh, 
50 years after we've uh, already been there. Uh, so we can't ignore the moon. We do things at the moon that uh, will help the other nations. And we tell them that because we, not going, are the logical leader to bring together all the international uh, nations that have the capability uh, of doing that. We were the leaders in the International Space Station. Unfortunately, uh, as, as things went in the last uh, several years, we decided it was inappropriate to invite the Chinese to become uh, uh, members of the uh, International Space Station. And, uh, and I think that that was not a good idea. Uh, during the Cold War, we uh, did a joint mission with the Russians in 1975, where uh, a Soyuz was in space, and then we launched an Apollo, did the maneuvering, uh, came together, and, and built a lot of it, and did a lot of the things that made that possible, uh, a handshake in space between cosmonauts and uh, astronauts. We had a that, term, detente. It's kind of space detente. I mean, we don't use that yeah, much well, today. No, it, it didn't lead to peace immediately, yeah. but yeah. it certainly was a great demonstration of uh, goodwill, I think, on the part of... Uh, the United States, we, we did leave a plaque on the moon that said, uh, here men from the planet Earth first set foot upon the moon, July 1969. We came in peace for all mankind. And to me, that really summarized all of the Apollo program that it was uh, done out in the open. Uh, it was done uh, by uh, not the military, but it was done by the civil space program. And we shared every uh, piece of information we were able to gather from that yeah, with all the uh, international uh, countries. Now, guess what happens in 2015, the uh, 40th anniversary of that Apollo Soyuz meeting in space. I think it would be a good time to revisit that decision that I think was wrong uh, and re invite the Chinese to become partners uh, in the International Space Station. Uh, right now, we can't even get to our own space station. We buy, we buy rides on the Russian rockets. Our, our U.S. astronauts, we spend money and, uh, and we don't have any access to a space station. We, it costs we, $100 billion. We clearly have made some grievous mistakes since Apollo. And the, the people who participated in those mistakes don't want the public to know about it. But we sure did. Uh, uh, and, and that's why we have to pay the Russians $65 million to take one of our astronauts up to our hundred billion dollar space station because we had seven years starting in uh, 2004 and uh, retiring the shuttle at the end of 2010. We had seven years to come up with a replacement. When is it going to fly with the crew? Right now, 2021. 10 years after we retired the shuttle. That is not in keeping with a great nation to, to uh, 
have that happen. No wonder. No, no wonder our, our people are not that enthusiastic about what we do with one half of one percent of the budget. During the uh, peak preparation years, 1967, we had three and a half, maybe four percent, but it dropped down rather rapidly to uh, one percent, then less than a half a percent. You can't do the things that NASA would like to do that would uh, be what a great nation can do, could do, should do. We can't do that because we're too visible and easy to, to cut back, whether it's uh, sequestration or, or some office of management budget way of, uh, uh, of trimming things down. The space program is highly visible. Well, let's cut it back, cut it back. I can it's see your shame. Okay, let's, let's get to the questions and answers, but before we do that, we, one, of the, one of the things that we've uh, brought tonight is a little uh, uh, video uh, that kind of gets to the issue of reaching out to other generations, and you, you do a lot of talking to young people, uh, schools, but uh, let's throw that video on, because it does show a side of Buzz Aldrin that maybe a lot of you haven't seen. Is that okay to keep you, up? you guys have heard about the uh, uh, Mayflower, the pilgrims on the Mayflower landed at Plymouth Rock. They didn't wait around for the return trip. There was no return trip. They came to settle. Thank goodness. <laughs> Is a rocket experience. That was geisty. I have only two passions, space exploration and hip hop. People in the rap game, we've known about Buzz for years. The group Black Star. People think we named it after Marcus Garvey and the whole Black Star line. Nah, it's named after Buzz, Dr. Rendezvous, because you know he had those orbital rendezvous techniques he developed at MIT. You know, the person that had the biggest inspiration on, my, on everything I do as far as music and production and just Everything is, has to be Buzz Aldrin. The best that ever did it. I saw the first moon walk. And uh, when we saw the guys get off that spaceship, you know, the, the, gravi the lack of gravity and everything else, and all the animals were cool, but the one Buzz, my man Buzz, you know, the brother had a great groove going on. You know, he had this little, this little step going, and he was so cool. The song, uh, Whitey on the Moon, Gil Scott Heron, what you thought he was talking about, LBJ and Nixon? No, he was talking about Buzz Aldrin. I can't pay no doctor bills, but Whitey's on the moon. Gil and I are cool now. I explained to him that we came in peace for all mankind, and he backed off. People think of hip-hop, and they think of beefs. We had East Coast, West Coast beef, down South, up top beefs, but it doesn't compare to the beef between Earthwalkers and Moonwalkers, which I think is a way more dangerous beef. I don't have any beef with the Earthwalkers. We was posted up at my pad playing a little video game, Fight Night 4. The buzz leaned over and was like, yo, Snoop, I'm thinking about doing this record to commemorate my 40th year anniversary walking on the moon. Say, you know, uh, Snoop, you, you gotta do a little more work on your left jab there, too. I will know? do that. I was shocked when, when Buzz hit me on Twitter and was like, yo, I'm working on this album. But, you know, he wanted to get more of like an underground feel, so he had to bring me in. You know, I had to do my thing on the record. Well, it sure is fun Twittering with you. Oh, yeah, you know, I'm the Twitter king, you know. Tell the story about my time on the moon now. The sky was flat, even though the sun shined down. The moon looking such a trip, it's so fine. Like you're walking in the lunar dust. I really admire the way Buzz takes chances. You know, like how he challenged the NASA space program, and, and even the track itself. Is there a word for something that you can't explain in words? Ineffable, I think that would be the word, ineffable. That track is ineffable. Imagine a place above the sky, riding orbits in 90 minutes of time. All you need is to come with me. I'll be your guide. Go flying into outer space. I am the spaceman. Save this 
So Buzz, uh, I'm curious, what do you think of this auto-tune trend in music nowadays? Now listen, that's no good. It's all played <laughs> out. I don't want to have anything to do with that. So no auto-tune in this song? No, no, no. Okay. I need rock and experience. Yeah, man, I think we need to tone the beat down just a little bit because uh, we're going to lose the message. It's too hard. What you need is a rocking experience. So when you're saying it, visualize yourself performing it. Put a little bit more attitude in it. Go up in a rocket. Exactly, yeah. like if you was flying in space. Yeah. All you need is the rocket experience. All you need is the rocket experience. <laughs> All you need is a rocket experience. All you, you need, need is a rocket experience. All you need, need is a rocket experience. There it is. Take I that. Think take I that. that. I think That's I got it. That's it. Take that. that. Y'all gotta read this book, man. Buzz Aldrin is so gangster. Now, yeah, Buzz, we need a remix of the song. And I got you. I'm gonna do a G-mix style. From the ground, to the fly, to the high, to the sky, to the clouds, to the stars, to Mars. The stars can see. It's me, D-O-Double-G, to the moon. Consume, let the bass go boom. We can fly in a rocket, got the smoke in a socket. You can put it in your pocket, unlock it. I'm a rocket, it's Snoop, D.O. Dub with Buzz. That's my cuz, I'ma show you what it is. Now you know what it was. It's the G Mix, fly me to space. I like that Snoop Dogg stuff. That's pretty good. <laughs> All right. We got, uh, we got time for a few questions. I'm going to recognize uh, the volunteers in a particular side of the aisle and let them go to someone in their area for the questions. So let's take the question uh, right here, and you have the first question in your area right here. So someone in this area, around, hold your microphone up so they can see you. If someone has a question, raise your hand and she'll give you the mic. All this many years later, are, have you had any physical effects from space travel? Uh, I'm getting older. <laughs> <clears throat> but uh, I still look pretty young. And I'm, uh, I, I'm having a lot more fun with my freedom. Uh, in case you haven't read in the, the newspapers, I'm uh, single again. <laughs> That's a warning. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go to the next question here. <laughs> Second one could get even better. Uh, Bob G, you're at the back. Uh, you question right there. Uh, Buzz, you're an extraordinary human being and a great American. Thank you so much for coming to Little Rock. And I think I speak on behalf of the community when I say it's an honor to have you here, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, I saw a video uh, where a gentleman, Bart Sebrel, was accosting you and this gentleman uh, said that you weren't on the moon and it was all a big hoax and you punched him in the face. And I have a question. So, so sir, my question to you is can you please take a moment to address the kind of questions that folks do have who say, oh, we were never on the moon. What are these what are these folks addressing, and can you take a moment to dispel such rumors? Thank you, sir. Well, you know, I, I really don't have to do that anymore because of uh, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter has taken pictures, and you can see our lander, and you can see the experiments that were put out there uh, you can even see the crater behind uh, us that uh, we flew over. As a matter of fact, when you, when you put your foot down on the moon, 
not only do you leave a boot print, but you kick up dust. And the dust changes the reflection of uh, off the surface of the moon. And if you look very carefully at this lunar reconnaissance orbiter, you can see where, while I was getting back in the spacecraft, uh, Neil uh, kind of jogged out to this crater, took a couple of pictures of it, and then came back in again, and you can see those trails. 44 years later, remarkable. Just tells you that uh, things don't change an awful lot uh, way out there. So you Chinese, it ain't gonna change. Just take your time and uh, we'll help you get there. All right, at the back, right back here on this aisle. Back now, um, yeah, he called me. Uh, we'll continue. He called me a liar and a cheat. What do you expect me to do? Just. <laughs> All right, back here at the back on this aisle. Would you raise your microphone, ma'am? Yes, right back there. So someone in that area. Somebody must want to ask the question, what did it feel like? You know, fighter pilots don't feel things. Uh, we got, we got ice water in our veins. How we don't have emotions either. Go ahead with your question. How, how did you feel and Neil feel when you guys were the first two men to walk on the moon? Very, very proud and uh, grateful for a nation that gave us the opportunity to uh, do what we uh, were so proud to be able to do. Uh, did we earn that? Well, yeah, we kind of worked hard, all three of us, uh, but we were also in the right place at the right time. and. Uh, 24 Americans reached the moon. Not all walked on the moon, 12 of us did, but uh, without the pioneering effort of those other 12, we wouldn't have been able to uh, land and come back home. We had to have somebody that we would rendezvous with uh, that would bring us back home. So remember that number. 24 Americans. Question right over here. Raise your hand, sir. And, and someone in this area has a question. Dr. Aldern, my name is Mary Catherine. Um, and I wanted to ask you, uh, you mentioned that the spacecraft that the Chinese are using is very similar to that that the uh, Russians used with their Soyuz program. And so my question for you is, uh, do you think, or first of all, I guess, is our information and our technology open source to the world, to nations and entities that may be interested in further exploring the moon and uh, other planets? And if not, do you think that it should be? Uh, let me see if I under, is, is our, uh, are our talents, our capabilities, is it available uh, to the rest of the world? Yes, sir, like the yeah. plans and science Well, and some, some of the information on uh, launch rockets, uh, especially some of the use of uh, rockets that are also used to launch military satellites. Um, that is uh, information that we don't want to spread around. It's a talent that we've uh, worked very hard to get. And uh, uh, 
I think that we can cooperate, share peaceful information without uh, losing that capability. I think the gains that we can ha make by cooperation uh, far exceed what we uh, might put at some risk. Um, and, and I think space is the place to do that. Uh, we did that with the Soviet Union in 1975. Uh, and, and I think uh, we can begin to do that if we continue to obey some people who forbid NASA from ever talking to somebody in China, uh, I, I think we're on the road to greater and greater friction. And I hate to say it, but that's the way you move toward uh, World War III. Uh, we, we have to open the door uh, wisely. And I think space is the place to do that. And possibly it'll filter down and make our relations here on the surface of the earth uh, much more uh, friendly, um, probably always have human rights problems with China, probably always have copying, hacking, uh, uh, invading our uh, computer systems, uh, probably always uh, be faced with territorial uh, aggression on the part of, uh, uh, of China. We've got time but for one more. Peace up there. We've got time for one more question. Bob G. There we go. Final question. Um, how did it feel when you blasted off? When you left the moon. That was the yeah, question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How about it? That's How a good that question. Go? How did it feel when you blasted off leaving the moon? That's a pretty good question. Good for yeah. you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you want the short answer or the long one? <laughs> uh, I'm here. Okay. Not up there. Uh, you, you, you know, the circuit breaker that has to be pushed in called the engine arm circuit breaker, broke off. And uh, we weren't sure uh, that when we tried to push it in that it would uh, complete the circuit. So the people in Houston were pretty busy while we were trying to sleep. Uh, but uh, instead of five minutes before liftoff, about two hours, I guess, uh, I didn't put my little finger in there. I didn't put a metal object. I put a felt tip pen and pushed it in, and it worked. <laughs> the liftoff, the liftoff uh, was very relieving, to say the least. Uh, it's a fixed engine, a very, uh, very simple fixed thrust and fixed direction. So when the engine isn't firing through the center of gravity, there's a tendency to put the thrusters fire downward. And so the, the launch itself is sort of a, a, a wallowing back and forth because of the simplicity that's uh, that's designed in, into that rocket. And uh, of course, once we got into orbit, then uh, Dr. Rendezvous is, uh, is on the spot. <laughs> and uh, we, we did things very well <laughs> and got there and uh, docked uh, with uh, Mike Collins in the spacecraft. We uh, vacuumed our suits from all the dust and uh, brought in the rock boxes and left 
the eagle ascent stage in orbit, the descent stage was on the ground. And home we came. We got one little extra uh, video, and uh, let's see uh, how that goes. Uh, this is a surprise uh, as well. I hope you enjoyed this uh, minute or so of a new uh, Aldrin Enterprise. <laughs> flight all the way to the right, Fido, or go flight, catch. We're go with no attitude. So, telecom, GMC, ECOM, This is called Buzz Aldrin's Space. Owen Manager, AFD, Space Manager. Go. It's a video game. Network, Capcom, give me a green light, and we'll go for LOI. Before we, uh, before we close, I have two announcements to make. One, uh, the, I want to say what a pleasure it is and a privilege it is to partner with the Clinton Foundation. Uh, Stephanie Street, Lena Harkin, all the people who have worked with this foundation, Joyce Akubin, who does great work, Terry Garner with the library. The Clinton Foundation does remarkable work in Arkansas uh, and all over the country and the world. They make uh, remarkable things happen for people. And here in Little Rock, they are making a huge difference. So I just want to say a special thanks. I don't think they get the credit that they deserve. And I, I just want to say a special thanks to the Clinton Foundation for all they do to make lives better for other people. And when, when Dean Senator Pryor, David Pryor, started this speaker series in 2004, on November 18th, 2004, he invited Senator Bob Dole to be the first speaker. And since that time, under the leadership of Nikolai De Pippa, who I think runs the best college speaker series in the country, we've had over 750 programs, free and open to the public. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, is the largest ever of those 750 programs. So join me in thanking Buzz Aldrin and Leonard David. Thank you for coming. <laughs>